Hi folks, this is um, possibly one of the more major parts of this, uh, of this unit. It's a lot of separate examples of uh, AI, IT, and deep learning in health and medicine. And uh, we just, these are not terribly coherently presented because the world is not terribly coherent at the moment. All right, so this is this uh, healthcare company, Geisinger. And they have an AI system for interpreting CT scans. And it just um, drastically, uh, not surprisingly, drastically improves performance. Nine, nine hours to 19 minutes. And um, it identified uh, a CT scan from somebody with uh, some sort of um, bleeding in the brain, which was not otherwise identified. And basically what this too, when they find a signal, they bump up that particular CT scan for the uh, radiologist to, to look at. So it's actually just changing priorities. It's not actually making decisions. So that's a, that seems a solid win-win situation. Okay, here is um, an AI testing test for diabetes, and it uh, comes from. Uh, Group in Israel, Weizmann Institute of Science is a very well-known university in Israel, and um, it analyzes electronic health record data, and it um, identifies the possibility of this at the start of pregnancy, and it um, therefore can help to uh, decrease mortality for the mothers who uh, who uh, need special care. And um, the half of this uh, discussion is about this nice term, social determinants of health. Namely, that uh, such an analysis has to be customized to your particular area. And so it probably wouldn't be directly applicable in the USA. But it sounds rather unlikely if it won't be modifiable. And it gives here that um, this. Uh, Currently in the U.S., there's a strong ethnic variation in this uh, in this particular disease. Uh, precision medicine. Well, precision medicine is not very well defined. Basically, means you uh, um, produce a health strategy which depends on the patient. Well, that's obviously something where AI is going to be totally critical. Because there's going to be AI, which is, drives personalization for everything in other areas. So this is personalized, really personalized medicine. Uh, the examples here are adverse drug reactions, um, which can be mapped through, which can be identified through DNA, and actually other issues. You can just, you can obviously train a deep learning network to, uh, to buy with the existing adverse drug reaction data. To see what uh, drives, that, which which actually is the best way of doing that, we can do better diagnoses. We effectively looked at that, and that gives you better treatment. They can look at, uh, they can do custom cancer treatments, and um, you can identify cancer earlier, so-called stage zero. And um, IBM Watson was an example of actually, unfortunately, not a terribly successful system because probably it was a bit oversold, which actually analyzed a lot of this information against uh, existing literature to uh, get the best possible um, input into any decisions. There's this uh, health company in Utah which uh, looks at genetic variants to help uh, oncologists make treatment decisions and. Uh, do better in curing um, cancer, and there was a sort of 92% improvement. That's great. I'm sure all this will work. Quite how soon and which area will work best is not so clear, but uh, <coughs> anything to do with images is likely to be the best, or anything which can be trained. If you have training data, then you can really do a good job. But you can train on anything, not just images. You can just Feed in patient um, specifications or EHR lab lab results, and then you can train that on those things to identify which particular 
um, information signals a particular problem. Uh, so oncology is um, going to be uh, a major impact because of the uh, image-based uh, nature of some of the analysis, and also how important it is to avoid errors. And I gather errors are quite common in this thing, in this uh, field, because it's probably pretty tricky to know the best possible way of, of tackling it. And there was lots of malpractice uh, money. We've mentioned that already. And um, so, as cancer, uh, well, everything in life keeps on costing more. So AI power precision medicine is likely to be a very perceived to be a very useful thing to do. And the consumer's willingness to do genetic testing to assess cancer risk should AI should them help. How much of the AI is really based on gen genes, and how much on actual images is not quite clear to me. Um, it's, I don't know that there's that much evidence that this is a dramatically impressive thing, namely that your gene is significantly valuable. Uh, I didn't see that documented. That's something we should do some research on. Okay, here is another cancer one with Microsoft. All the, we learned at the first slide of this whole, um, whole unit that big tech has got lots of investments in health for obvious reasons. Because uh, it's um, a natural thing for them to work on because they have the experts who are able to do this. And um, cervical cancer is, I gather, is preventable but not diagnosed. And uh, a quarter of the world's deaths in this area are actually in India. And um, this comes from going through pap smear samples and other types of data to obeying fine choices again. This is not actually making a decision, it's telling the doctor which patients to really look at. And this gives a huge increase in um, performance and identification of the difficult problems. Um, this uh, chart here shows a very low incidence in the North America and a rather high incidence in India. All right, here is a reasonably simple, but possibly, presumably extremely useful piece of software to help uh, ultrasound software choose where to take images of the, of the patient. And um, this is so-called echocardiograms. And um, this basically, you don't need the expert to position the device to take this, these pictures. Uh, the software is called Caption Guidance because the company is called Caption or Caption Health. And um, again, this will free up more time of specialists. So at least initially, it is mainly expected to help the specialists rather than um, take away their jobs because this is really a, uh, to help them do an easier job, a better job. A hard monitoring. And uh, Verily uh, teamed up with uh, electrocardiogram to develop monitors for uh, uh, um, variations in heart heartbeats and things. And um, they have an image analysis system to, ultra to an automate analysis of ultrasound-based heart scans. Um, well, this general problem of um, the heart being impacted by the uh, the blood and things is um, a giant problem, a trillion dollars by 2035. Uh, anything that can be done to, uh, to forecast these problems is obviously a good idea. Robot nursing aid. So here we have a so totally different type of application from the robot world. You have all been and had your blood taken. And it's pretty tricky to have your blood taken because you have to guess press the needle in the right place. And uh, I gather that they managed to train a robot to press the needle in the right place. And um, while it only well, it says it's 97%, but that's with people with easy to locate veins. Presumably, those of us with not so easy to locate veins uh, may not find it so easy. In any case, um, 
Inserting needles into veins is, um, I gather, the most common clinical procedure in the world, and 1.4 billion procedures annually in the US. And so, as this is non trivial, 27 of the patients without visible veins, 40% without uh, palpable veins, and 60% of emaciated patients uh, failing to do this right, the automatic robots can. Uh, presumably help if you can really train them to do the right answer, which probably you can. There's probably a set of rules you can instantiate. So this is a combination of vision and touch. Well, this is a fun one, using AI to determine beauty. So the plastic surgeons are all working on pretty beautiful people to make them more beautiful, or, or anyway, various. Um, added beauty uh, processes, and I would imagine all these uh, uh, fake image-based systems, uh, uh, GANs and things, will do an incredible job in deciding how to uh, do this in the optimal fashion. So this will not only make people more beautiful, they'll probably do it cheaper, because you'll probably be able to find of all the possible ways of making somebody more beautiful, which is the easiest and cheapest to do. Of course, the plastic surgeons may or may not like the cheapest one. I'm not certain. Probably, probably there are lots of. Probably they can then expand their business to more people. All right, here is a um, take, taking blood tests. While well, this is, all these diagnostics are highlighted by the problems with the coronavirus, which is whose diagnostics are very badly done, and uh, this one can analyze DNA taken in a sample and match. Um, identify infections and match it to a thousand diseases. And uh, this is a $2,000 test. Not quite certain why it costs $2,000. Uh, whether it's the uh, the device that you use or whether it's the software running. The software running should be essentially free after it's trained. Um, anyway, it's like finding so-called cell-free DNA, DNA not attached to the human cell. And that comes from uh, these nasty things that invade us. And then you just uh, analyze those to um, with a standard Illumina sequencer. And um, then draw conclusions. So this, this type of thing, I think, is a sure win. The more we can do, move to telemedicine and doing more at home, this is a low, low, low. Um, some sort of modest form of telemedicine where we don't actually do the full thing. We just have a set of things we can do at home that's bound to be very helpful. It would assure help with this coronavirus. Here we have stroke detection, um, which is again uh, looking at uh, CT scans. And this is again a classic image problem. And then alerting the, the specialist. This is, we've seen this so often. Um, that um, and this is for a company called Viz.ai, which was earlier stated as one of the ones whose software had already been approved, and um, it's been used in 300 hospitals, and it has the standard but still very important uh, feature of just making it uh, making it much easier and quicker to uh, give treatment. Um, opioid addiction. Well, opioid addiction is, I guess, some. Um, the signal for that can be uh, the user's breathing pattern, um, which uh, I gather the opioids affect your respiratory system. And uh, this again is a simple, relatively straightforward local device that identifies problems. And um, this is digital therapeutics example from the company called Pair, which was um, I think purchased by Novartis. And um, this is the fancy way of saying opioid addiction, substance abuse disorder. And uh, I gather there were 70,000 deaths last year. Um, and um, obviously solutions um, can be, any solutions or any ways of alleviating it will be good. All right, here we have a fun thing, namely nice huggy, hugging robots. 
Um, uh, so we have Cloy robots with uh, conversational AI capabilities. I remember I went to uh, the Consumer Electronics Show a few years ago, and I was amazed by the number of AI part cuddly teddy bears. Every AI researcher uh, in the world, these all the better ones, had a cuddly teddy bear startup, which was uh, trying to learn, talk to you. It's like Alexa, but it, Alexa sitting in a teddy bear and it's meant to learn what you, how to keep you happy. And uh, this is obviously particularly relevant for patients. And um, so this is, again, can have AI built into it. And uh, could the same robot could actually monitor the results from the from any devices there. All right, so that's, here is the robot pictures. They're really sort of sweet, but not terribly exciting. Here is a, a somewhat broader topic, namely both physician burnout and sort of administrative issues, which are sort of um, sort of connected. In the, the claim here is physicians are not burnt out because they have to think deeply about what they're doing, but rather there's just so much, so much paperwork and uh, documentation and things like that that they get unnecessarily uh, frustrated. And there's and there's there is no doubt that uh, physicians are quite uh, highly worked, heavily, uh, possibly overworked, and um, this affects productivity and also the quality of the care. And uh, as Corona comes along, obviously the stress on the physicians is going up. And there's a statement here that several, not surprisingly, that in China, at the time of the outbreak, 72% of healthcare workers uh, felt reported feeling distressed. And there are various AI solutions where you might expect the, the best ones would just automate the whole process and give you a sort of robot administrator. But uh, most of them are actually somewhat simpler. They're basically looking at the voice and um, Recording of the voice aspects of the um, of the problem. Here we have Amazon transcribe medical um, speech from physician patient to text. Uh, notable health is more along the lines I was thinking. We'll have a little slide about that later. It's actually trying to automate the workflow. Um, and Nuance, Nuance is a very famous. Uh, Voice company, it had something called Dragon, naturally speaking, was one of the earliest and actually not so successful. It didn't have this breakthrough results which needed deep learning. They, of course, now use deep learning, but the first ones they had didn't. Suki, there is another slide on, has a very focused uh, NLP related solution. Uh, these uh, companies and things are summarized here Amazon. Notable Health, Nuance, Dragon, and Suki. Here is uh, what they're doing, because Amazon has broad capabilities, even if their first offering is more uh, NLP based. And here are some of their applications, dictation, transcription, that's of course all natural language processing. I point out no, Notable is trying to actually uh, pro do the administrative task of scheduling and things like that. Nuances again, um, the uh, documenting, the producing of the text, and as is Suki. And this is, um, well, we see that three doing NLP, so that's reasonably competitive, although the field is so big, I'm sure you could have three vendors without a lot of trouble. And here is this thing which uh, says a third of the US providers think they do not spend enough time with their patients. Here is um, transcribe medical with the audio converting and then um, getting anchor accurate transcripts. And here is a survey of what the uh, prostrate physicians. And the next slide describes the notable system, the one after that, the Suki system. And uh, it's um, here we have, it actually runs on an Apple Watch. It's clear that Apple has 
Surprising how little competition Apple has for its watch. I mean, I have a Fitbit, which is not an Apple Watch, because I have an Android phone, and an Apple Watch doesn't support Android phones. Slightly frustrating, because their watch does appear to be the best product on the market. Uh, as we'll see in uh, various parts of this, uh, these things, both Fitbit and Apple have pretty interesting offerings in the in the health area, and. Um, so this is sort of automated, uh, in sort of linked with electronic health records, and uh, tries to take away the mechanics of the interacting with the EHR. So that's uh, notable, and now we go on to Suki. Uh, well, here, as I mentioned already, the voice was very promising, and. Um, this last slide and this set of example is voice recognition. And uh, it's basically doesn't do, it's not the obvious voice recognition of say chatbots. So I dial into my coronavirus on the web website and the chatbot tells me whether or not I'm about to be uh, sent off to a ventilator. Rather, this one is for doctors and doctor interactions with patients to try to generate uh, notes and uh, it allows the doctors to document their interactions with patients much faster. And um, obviously, this could be this bound to work. Well, Suki may not work, but this concept has to work because voice recognition is so good. All right, so this is the end of this uh, set of examples. Thank you very much. Here is a comment about 23andMe. That's 23andMe, this is Ancestry.com, this is the rest. And this just points out that um, there's a growing interest in genetic testing. Um, and um, it's actually, although this is growing, it does seem to have reached a sort of arm pass because I'm, I actually have a 23andMe sample, but all it does tells me is hey Jeffrey, another another um, 60 people have joined 23andMe and they are 0.8 percent or less matched to you because the only things they find, at least for me, are, are obvious near relatives where the match is much higher, and the rest are all you know, many cousins removed, and uh, about four gener five generations back they branched off. And so I don't see that's very exciting. Uh, here is a certainly separate topic, the uh, digital health funding. And this is sort of actually a little like um, the funding of FinTech. It's sort of peaked in 2018. FinTech, if you remember, peaked at that time. Um, and notice when it all started. Again, started that we really screwed up. Around 2013, where we had leadership in many, many relevant areas, we should have just set up our own company to do any of this stuff, FinTech, blood tech, whatever, image tech, everything. All right, here is sort of um, an interesting comment, which I sort of hinted at already. Namely, the genome has not proven to be quite the revolution that was expected. There are some things you can detect with DNA, but you can't go and I mean, this is why 23 and me and people are having trouble. You can't go grab somebody's genome and say, mm, you're going to have um, Alzheimer's at 62, uh, broken blood vessel at 73, etc. It is not very precise. It's a pretty complicated to go from the genome to the problems. And this vision that the genome would be your uh, your, all you needed to look at to do the personalized medicine is not shown to be successful. And articles that uh, it, it appears uh, 30 years ago suggested to the opposite have been withdrawn. And there is no very simple way of mapping a gene into illness. Um, there are some, there are a few cases like Huntington's disease, which are very Clear, and I say we've mentioned these things like identifying genes from the coronavirus, which are clear, but on DNA, I should say. But um, 
Most serious diseases are not caused by single gene mutations, and they cannot be cured by replacing the bad gene with a better gene. So there are going to be some cases where gene therapy will succeed, but there's not the universal thing on which, which um, personalized medicine is built. In fact, if you look at what personalized medicine is being built, it's being built on the things we already mentioned, imaging. <coughs> AI analysis of EHR data and things like that. Um, more actually, it's still AI, but it is not genomics-based AI. It is deep learning analysis of a variety of different uh, signatures of the human health. This is a more um, general comment of, for the whole of this uh, course. Um, not that there is genomics is an area we learned was just not going as fast as it ought to. Uh, consumer robotics is also pretty slow. I've already commented dozens of times that VR and augmented reality uh, haven't been taken off. And blockchain is still struggling to be the great success it's meant to be. If we look at healthcare, this company, Business Intelligence, said that blockchain will move to the forefront. But it ain't true. Um, and there was a, a pilot program, and um, there's a claim of a blockchain solution in 2023. Well, nobody can think that far ahead. Um, and by a blockchain, uh, sorry, business intelligence said that the other, they did make a, a negative prediction that was correct, namely that telemedicine would not take off in 2019. But actually in 2020, due to the coronavirus, it could well take off. So that has changed. Because treatment at home, the ability to be able to treat disease patients away a suitably social distance the way has proven to be very successful. Um, here we have another actualization of AI, which is using trained networks, presumably, which is looking for medication errors. And presumably, you can easily, rather well, straightforwardly train networks to map medications into yes or no as, as a good idea. And they uh, claim to have had a 92% uh, efficiency. But the, and again, this type of software doesn't actually have to um, reliably get the answer. It just has to give to the doctor a, a, a sample of, of um, medication strategies that look suspect. So this is digital therapeutic. Um, here is sort of um, a totally um, uh, off base things, um, which is that um, you can often find events from information implying the event. I remember a long time ago, uh, one of my, um, we, you know, the very early informatics undergraduate class, we were, we did a study which other people have also done at the same time or probably before. How you can actually find out about earthquakes from tweets before the US Geological Survey tells you about it. Similarly, the Wuhan virus can be detected by, um, by information on the web before it becomes clear to the, uh, the people whose business is to um, uh, predict these things. And there was a company. Blue Dot that discovered the epidemic at the end of December, and the CDC found it on January 6th, and the World Health Organization January 9th. And this was just uh, an AI driven algorithm which does information and treatment. It analyzes text and looks for uh, signatures which are indicative of particular um, health related events. Notice this failed for Google flu. Because it tried to look at, um, uh, I don't know, tweets or equivalent about a flu and got the wrong answer. It, uh... Okay, here we have um, Fitbits. And uh, I've always wondered that Fitbit does a very poor job of actually using the data. 
that uh, these watches send back to Fitbit Central. And actually, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, the Scripps, which is a very well known San Diego based uh, institution, it actually got identified data from 200,000 Fitbit users. And they were able to detect rising heart rates and changing in sleep patterns, which predicted flu outbreaks in real time. Of course, they did it later on after Fitbit gave them the data. And it was not done in real time. So, um, and this chart here just says that these wearables are getting more and more popular. Here's the number of people with wearables such as this. And um, I don't think this is a great device, but it's certainly a useful device. And uh, of course, Google has now purchased Fitbit, and so hopefully it will get uh, maybe more resources put into it to get us something which might vaguely compete with Apple Watch with an Android uh, interface. And um, and also maybe the data will actually be analyzed in a thoughtful fashion. So that's promising. All right, here we are. I know we, we actually had a few slides on aspects of IoT and health, including the Internet of Medical Things. Here is a Fitbit again from the same as last slide. And they have a new smartwatch uh, called Sense. Uh, and uh, it measures stress um, with electrodermal activity, the electrical activity in your skin. And uh, this is meant to allow Fitbit to tell you how to, when you need to take deep breathing exercises and to meditate. Um, in general, this illustrates that smartwatches are Pretty promising for as an Internet of Thing um, platform because obviously the trouble about the phone is it's not in contact with you, and so it can't actually recognize many of your problems. And uh, there was a company called New Tigers from Princeton that has expertise here. They point out that the hardware that Fitbit is using is naturally commercially oriented and therefore is not the leading edge sensor and so it may not be uh, it may not give us a precise answers as you need for medical for medical uh, precision but still uh, new tigers is in this field and so is fitbit and so as we see on the next slide is apple and it's been it's extremely um, promising and uh, here it points out that the smartwatch Revenue is growing 20% per year, um, and Apple was the is actually growing in fraction a little, and um, these other ones, Garwin and Huawei, are, are just hanging in there, um, and Apple is adding actually in these. I think we're up to. Um, watch six at the moment, and that has a blood oxygen detection feature, and um, it's uh, helps you to learn how to uh, um, how to get to sleep and what's stopping you from sleeping. I guess I'd like that. I don't sleep well these days, um, and so this is actually pretty promising. It is surprising to me that more major vendors like the Android community and Google do not put more effort into watches. Because um, I say trouble with Apple is it doesn't work with Android phones, and Android phones are the dominant phone. We just did um, Apple, now we come to Amazon. And of course, we did Fitbit before that, Fitbit, which is Google's trying to purchase. And they, Amazon has their system called Halo, which is you know, really compact uh, wristband. This is a different approach. It's nearer Fitbits, where you don't try to go after the full watch, but rather you just have things that go around your wrist. And that's not obviously a bad idea. Here we have the little console, and it's all connected to sleep, which uh, is pretty important. Uh, body fat percentage, uh, and analysis of stress in your voice, and things like that. So. This is an area where there's lots of activity, and I think it's extremely promising. And it is likely to accelerate, in my opinion, because this actually works. 
Okay, that's it on uh, these uh, new uh, watch-related uh, health monitors. Well, here is the old Watson type project, which is actually done by Microsoft called Project Hanover. And they, this is AI technology to read specialized medical and um, documents and research papers, which they can for, uh, which they then summarize for a knowledge base. And they obviously just look for tags, chemicals, um, diseases and things like that. And then this one particular one was looking on for cancer. And um, they um, then used the ones they identified and extracted information from it. Because, you know, there's so much research and work in this area, no one person can possibly keep track of it. Well, here we have uh, something we've always wanted, a toothbrush that talks to us. The Oral-B Guide. And it is integrated with Amazon Alexa, which it links to with its base. And um, it um, has, it's actually a pretty sophisticated toothbrush with lots of different modes. And it monitors what you do and feeds it all into the cloud. It tells you when you mess up, which is probably normally, because it's not so easy to get all this stuff right. And um, it's a, uh, I don't think this is quite as compelling as the sleep-related or body uh, body oxygen-related um, technologies in the previous um, slides, but it's still pretty interesting and illustrates how many, many, many things we just do sort of start. Uh, maybe we do them okay, but we don't always do them okay, and we're going to have little. Little monitors that will tell us when we screw up. So that's uh, the Oral B guide, the toothbrush you all want. Thank you. Yeah, here we come to uh, some examples of the internet of medical things, which we'd introduced earlier in the introduction. And um, we have three examples. Uh, uh, on this page, we have uh, glucose monitoring. And smart diapers are everything you, you would ever want. And um, for obvious reasons, these are good because they can monitor uh, things that uh, do need, uh, can be very usefully either processed by a doctor or in the case of the, the diaper, maybe processed by the, uh, the, the, the parents. Although I think the smart diaper is actually aimed at the medical applications. And uh, here we have the stethoscope, digital stethoscope and the portal, which again is obviously a very useful telehealth, telemedicine type facility, because you can just uh, remotely gather all the data you would typically uh, have a rather tiresome visit. I must admit, I don't like visiting anything, whether it be groceries or hospitals, they're rather, rather boring. So, um, that's uh, as obvious value. So these are sort of more sophisticated than some of the other examples we had connected with smartwatches, which are more commodity examples.